We're going to head and begin the next session now. Um, this is going to start feeling like a marathon conference. The good news is there is a break at 3.15 when we'll have some snacks and some coffee and tea available for you. Now, uh, this next set of panel discussions <laughs> is very exciting to me. And the reason is I actually took a sabbatical and spent a year at NASA Ames. So I have uh, in my heart a close place to NASA Ames. I'm very pleased to uh, introduce the members of the team who will be do doing the presentation. And this is a little bit high tech. One of the team members is actually joining us via Skype uh, from, I believe, California? Yes. From California. Uh, the topic of this panel discussion, which will include plenty of time for some interactive discussion, is gigapixel imaging use in planetary exploration. The uh, people who will be representing NASA Ames in this include Mike Sims, who's here on my far left. He's a research scientist in the uh, Intelligent Systems Division of NASA Ames and a co-investigator of the Mars Exploration Rovers, Deputy Chief Scientist for NASA Engineering and Safety, and co-founder of the Center for Collaboration Science and Applications. And then sitting next to Mike, we have Estelle Dodson. Estelle leads collaborative science and technologies for NASA Astrobiology Institute and the NASA Lunar Science Institute and is the co-founder of the Center for Collaboration Science and Applications in partnership with NASA, Carnegie Mellon, Milligan, Carnegie, Milligan, Carnegie Mellon, Silicon Valley, and Lockheed Martin. She's also the CTO of Lockheed Martin's NASA Ames program. And uh, last, closest to me, here on stage, we have a fine fellow, Pascal Lee, who is chairman of the Mars Institute, senior planetary scientist at the SETI Institute, and director of the NASA Houghton Mars Project at NASA Ames Research Center. And joining us via Skype from California, we have Dr. Chris McKay. He is planetary scientist with the Space Science Division of NASA Ames, and he received his PhD in astrogeophysics from the University of Colorado in 1982, and has been a research scientist with NASA Ames Research Center since that time. So let's welcome our panel. the relationship of that to planetary exploration. Um, and in particular, uh, gigapixels in, in the realm of gigapans, and also, giga, also in the realm in which we have very high bandwidth and extremely large displays, <coughs> offer in, new opportunities for us in, in NASA to, to do science remotely. Um, and it's particularly important to be able to do that in environments which are fragile, like the Mojave Desert, uh, Houghton Crater, and in places like lava tubes, where human presence actually can damage it and can make a difference for future generations being able to explore it. It's also true in remote and hard to access places, like Houghton Crater, which is in the Arctic, and in, um, on Mars. And thirdly, it's, in, it's important in transitory places, uh, like the Mojave, where the vegetation, for example, is changing as a function of timing. We would like to be able to access that and know what's going on um, as, as a function of time. And, and as Pascal may talk about getting across the northern, uh, across the Arctic in the Northwest Passage, what is also another environment that's transitory. So, is there another slide? Here? No. Okay, so given that, that introduction, we're going to spend about 10 minutes each uh, amongst ourselves uh, talking and presenting uh, four different arenas, and uh, at least. And I'm going to start by the first of us, which is Estelle. Go ahead. Hi. Can everyone hear me in the back or the front? Great. All right. So I, as, as the introduction said, I lead collaborative technologies for NASA's two virtual institutes. And virtual institutes are basically communities of researchers that are distributed around the country and uh, international partners as well. And what that allows us to do is tap into the best and the brightest across many different disciplines and respond quickly to research questions without having to bring everyone together, uh, build buildings, uh, move families. It also allows us to access infrastructures of the universities where the researchers are located. And specifically today I'll be talking about how we've used uh, GigaPans with the Astrobiology Institute. The Astrobiology Institute is looking at the study and origin of life. So how did life originate? How does life evolve? How would you search for life uh, here on Earth in extreme environments? 
and apply that to searching for life on other planets, uh, biosignatures. And it, it involves many, many different disciplines. So one of our challenges is how do you bring all these disciplines together across distances? We have our research teams distributed, as I said, across the country, but also around the world. And when you add everyone up, we have about 600 members at 150 locations. So we use technology, we use uh, social infrastructures, organizational infrastructures to bridge everyone and try to get them working together to address questions. Uh, as, as was mentioned, I'm also doing this for the Lunar Science Institute, uh, but today I'll be focusing on astrobiology. Another one of the challenges is uh, bridging time zones. As you can imagine, we span pretty much 24 time zones, and uh, so we use a combination of synchronous and asynchronous technologies to bring people together, which leads into bridging generations. Uh, many of the questions we're addressing take multiple generations to look at, and space missions as well can take 25 years in the planning, implementation, and execution of a space mission. So. Uh, that's another, what I think of as a collaborative technology, is how do you keep consistency and, and memory over time and train the next generation for exploring space. One of the areas where we find people come together is in field research. And field research uh, involves bringing people from different teams into remote locations. And we found that people go out to the field sites but the home team and, and the other team members who are spread around the country kind of don't necessarily access what, have access to what they're able to see. So going out to the field and taking high quality images provides a way for the rest of their teams to see what's going on. So I think of field research as a collaborative technology. In astrobiology, the field sites are often very hard to get to, expensive to get to, involve permitting and are in fragile uh, areas and sometimes extreme environments. So the more that we can do to bring back information to the rest of the team members, the better off we are. Some of the field sites that have been getting uh, a lot of attention and highlights in the last year are listed here. But every year we have a number of different field research activities going on, 76 total field sites in, uh, in 2009. And for those of you who are computer scientists or Python developers, here's an export from the database where we track all this. Uh, today I'll talk about the field collaborations that were done between Ariel Anbar, who's a biogeochemist, very interdisciplinary person, and he's at Arizona State, and they, did, uh, they collaborated with Roger Summons, who is a geobiologist from MIT. Now we collaborate with many more teams, but these were the two leads on uh, where this expedition was and where they took the GigaPan. Ariel has done a, a lot of work in education outreach, and so what he's doing is he's taking the GigaPan images and integrating it into virtual field trips, Google Earth, uh, online teaching units, and a lot of different activities that are accessible to um, ranging from his graduate students all the way down to elementary school. So he really tries to take what he's doing and use it in, in science education and education outreach. Oops. Okay. So the first GigaPan I'm going to show. is from their field site in Western Australia. And Ariel uploaded these. I should say he's Ariel has done about 25 of these, and, and this is just one that I'm going to show. But the whole both of the teams have an area where they upload images, share video files. Uh, and they're using a combination of video, gigapans, Flickr. I love the way they use all these technologies to share their resources. And then Ariel's team at ASU has also developed sort of a social networking wiki place as well. So this is a gigapan of the field site, and then you'll see he's marked some of the fossils. And so you can zoom in and, and see the fossils and annotate it, and then other people can access this as well and annotate and make their comments. Let's show one more. Here's another one. Mm 
One thing I want to say about this conference is I, I've learned so much. What I would like to do is capture everything and be able to bring it out to all the teams that are using this. And sometimes that's the biggest challenge is as people are doing cutting edge applications of these new technologies, how do we make that accessible to everyone? So I'm, I'm glad that we have this opportunity to share what we're learning and, and bring it to the rest of our teams. <coughs> And then up here, I just have a, the site marked where they are sharing from all the gigapans, they put the, the fossils into their Flickr site. It's a fairly long quote, but I thought it was worth sharing. This is from uh, one of the researchers at MIT. And basically, she's saying that they can't bring all the students to these locations. You can imagine traveling to Western Australia is quite expensive. Um, but they're able to give them that same feel uh, by sharing the gigapans. And uh, also share for the, the younger students, they're able to get that excitement of looking at a field site and looking for fossils and then zooming in when they found one and, and marking it and feeling like they're participating. And now I will turn it over to Michael. Sure. Um, do you want to? So what, actually, I'll say a word about this image. This is just a hyperwall. A, um, um, this one's around a third of a billion pixel uh, display wall. Uh, it's another avenue that we use for displaying very large images. It, uh, in these kind of hyperwalls, this particular one is a front end to a supercomputer. But in these kind of hyperwalls, you have the ability to display extremely large images and then sort of walk out and look at how it looks in the gross and then walk in and see a spot. It's, they're very useful for collaboration where you have a team standing around saying, oh, that makes sense or this doesn't. So uh, do you want to go to the next Yeah, one? actually one thing I want to add is uh, Ariel has talked about by using these gigapans, they're able to, um, when they come back from the field, they're able to share it with other people and get their input on things that they might have missed. So I think of this as an interdisciplinary opportunity. If, if a, a specialist isn't out in the field with you, you're able to take back a little bit of what you saw and get their input later, or follow up on a question that might come up after you're back home in the lab and say, well, what was, what was there? What was the context? What was the surrounding environment? And have all that from the large scale, big picture, down to the finest revolution resolution that you took the images. And what what you see on, the one thing I was going to point out is uh, if you see the NASA meatball little round thing there, and just to the left of it you'll see a nose, that's Steve Squires. He's the principal investigator for the Mars Exploration Rovers. That's an image from Mars Exploration Rovers that we will actually, that I, that I gave to that team and we'll actually look at it in a minute on um, geekapan.org. Next. And NASA meatball is our internal word for the NASA logo. <laughs> yeah. There's politics about what that looks like. <laughs> so um, the, the issue that I've sort of been addressing and trying to understand is how, how do you do science uh, with a remote team? And I, I gave reasons before that, that it might make sense. You know, the environment is fragile. If you think of going in and looking at caves where there are cave paintings, uh, people actually going in disturb that. As we heard yesterday from um, the National Geographic person at the keynotes talk, uh, there's sensitivity with uh, the people actually walking in and breathing creates um, damage to things like Tut's tomb. Right? So there, as we as human beings go out and explore, as we as human beings experience things, we have an impact. And one of the wonderful things, I think one of the things I love about um, the current state of the world is that we can explore things both as a human being liking to explore, as a child experiencing the joy of that, or as an adult experiencing the joy of that. Um, but we can also explore things as a scientific group remotely more and more. And so what I've been looking at, what I've been concerned about is how do we do that with very large teams. Uh, with teams that are distributed remotely, sometimes large teams, but specifically teams that are distributed remotely. Now, I, I, I work on the Mars rover, exploration rovers, uh, Spirit and Opportunity is sitting on Mars these days. And um, so we have a team that is distributed around the world, and there's a sense in which the robot is our agent who's doing his work or her work 
you know, on another planet, and how do we interact with that? And what you see in this picture is from the early days of doing exploration of Mars, this particular place is a place called Eagle Crater, and we're looking for cross-bedding, an indication of aqueous activity, an indication there was water there a long time ago, right? And we're pointing out, oh, this looks like a good spot to go and look microscopically and see what's happening. So that's what this image is, and this is kind of the technology that we use. We print a very large image out, put it on a table, and people stand around. Um, and part of that, that became part of the stimulus, I think, for Randy Sargent when he developed a system that we used at NASA, which evolved in part into what Gigapan is, um, that allows us to look at the, these images interactively and dynamically for very large mosaic images. Yeah. Um, so looking at that kind of as a world, here I've gone out into um, um, a, this is a particular place which is a lava tube, and the question is, this actually is into the lava tube, and yet there's a hole in the roof that's caved in so that moisture and other nutrients have fallen down from above, and that allows this kinds of, of growth inside of, inside of that lava tube, and it's of interest both to biologists on Earth, but to also to astrobiologists, people that care about how life might be on other worlds and how life might be in other places. Um, and so we've looked at lava, uh, we've looked at gigapans as part of that experience. What does it take for someone remotely to understand the vegetation? What's the kind of resolution they need? What kind of spectral information do they need? Can we, can we support a remote science team? Because everybody that would like to go to this environment can't really go. Practically, they can't go. Um, they may not be able to go because this environment might be destroyed over time or change, and they might not be able to go because they would damage it. So uh, this is just a, a couple of the environments, other environments, as a, in addition to Gigapan that we use for a display of that, and I already showed you the uh, hyperwall, um, the very large display wall at Ames. This is one at um, our collaborators at um, University of California, San Diego, and below you see a cave environment, which is, allows you to much more interactively interact with three-dimensional things, objects. No. no. Okay, great. Um, so, can you do? Okay. What you're looking at now is a uh, is an image that actually it comes from 1,400 images that we took over a number of months. Uh, an image mosaic from Mars, and it's from a place on Mars called Gusev Crater, and it's specifically at a place at Gusev Crater called Home Plate. And we, this is a 360 degree image. Um, the light areas in the, on the horizon uh, represent the north, the dark regions represent the south, we're in the southern hemisphere. Um, and what we did in this particular one is on the very far right you see a little hill. We sort of came from the left of that, came up over that hill, came back down that hill, came around behind us, and then came across the right from the, from the mid-range and the right side of the image up toward the spot where there's the white box. And that's a place that we call Tyrone. Uh, we were headed up the hill to spend our winter on that hill in front of us. Uh, we got stuck in very deep um, drifted uh, dust in its lower spot, um, but it was fortuitous because it exposed interesting um, mineralogical things. It was unfortunate in the sense that we lost one of the wheels and lost a great deal of mobility at, at this spot. But after this point, we, we came back out and uh, we created this uh, panorama of the entire scene that is really, it's, it's, Kikapan is a wonderful way to, exp to display this, and it's a capability that we largely did not have during the image when we were doing this side of, the, when we were at this particular location. So that's all I have. Next is going to be... Uh, um, oh, did you want to talk about the uh, No. But, there are other spots we can identify as, as we um, Next, we're going to move to Chris McKay. Who, Chris is back at NASA Ames, which is in the San Francisco <coughs> Bay Area. And Chris, it's all yours. OK, thanks, Michael. Uh, as Michael said in his introduction, 
One of the reasons we use robotics and imaging and collect these sorts of data sets is to provide access for teams of scientists to work in environments that are too fragile all to be tramping around that environment in the old fashioned way we used to do field work. And that's where I've gotten involved in this technology and with a particular application to studying deserts. So what you're seeing on the board, on the screen, is a gigapan image of the Mojave Desert. And it's a particularly interesting desert for us in that, along with many other deserts, we use this site as a way to understand how life survives in very dry, Mars-like conditions. Mojave is particularly interesting to us, or particularly useful to us, because it's so close. It's easy for us to get there from where we are here in Northern California. And so we test out a lot of our procedures and equipment there. But recently, it's also increased in importance with the realization that as a result of global warming, the Mojave is predicted to become much drier, with much hotter summers. And that's scientifically interesting. It's also interesting from a practical point of view to the millions of people that live in the Mojave or on the margins of the Mojave, or the Southwest deserts in general. So because of our interest in studying the Mojave, our interest in making our work relevant to astrobiology on Mars and relevant to understanding global change on Earth, we realized we need to collect a detailed database about the desert. We needed a technology that would allow us to map it out to essentially create what we call a virtual line. Want to store a state description, a complete detailed state description of the Mojave Desert in the year 2010. And then we'd like to do that every six months from now into the future. So that when the year 2020 comes around, and the Mojave is a very different place, it's a global warming, we can pull up the year 2010 and compare it. We don't know enough to know what questions we're going to be asking in the year 2020. So we don't know what data we should really be collecting in 2010. We can make a guess at it, but we really don't know the full scope of what we'd like to document now. So what I want to do is document everything, map out in detail. Uh, detail meaning all the way down to the level of a millimeter resolution looking at biological soil crusts. And in this image, maybe Estelle, you could zoom in toward that lava flow that we're seeing in the background. You can see the range of features here. You see plants on a fairly large scale, fairly easy to monitor. You see interesting geological features, weathering of the rock. And if you look closely, you can see even at the small scale, photosynthetic organisms, soil crusts, scan around the rock top and down and down on the soil in front of the outcrop. We want to know how all these features change. They all affect the rate at which water percolates through the desert, flows through the desert. Uh, they're interesting from us to us in the point of view of the ecology of the, of the desert and the ability of microbial life to survive in dry deserts. We may be seeing the Mojave transform into the Atacama as it gets drier. And we'd like to document that and understand that process. It's fascinating, and then it could be a recapitulation of how Mars dried out and lost its life forms. And who knows what the Atacama is transforming into with further drying. <coughs> So the, the scientific goal 
is to create a digital archive that allows us to move forward or backwards in time, well, backwards in time, and ask questions that we don't know right now what questions we're going to ask. So we want to document. And I think this is going to become ever more important approach in Earth studies. I think data documenting of environments where you want to collect all the data you possibly can because you don't know what questions you're going to ask in the future. And these ecosystems are changing. You can't look back at them anymore. So we want to digitally record them, in a sense, uh, purely from a science point of view. Now, there are other implications of this kind of approach as well. Obviously, from a policy point of view, and a urban planning point of view, this kind of data would also be useful. Uh, it also has potentials for public involvement and broadening scientific involvement, and this is how I ended up working with Michael and Estelle, which is if you're collecting this digital data to provide an archive with this environment, that digital data can also be used as a virtual exploration place, as a virtual meeting place for other scientists. So I can sit down with my colleagues and pull up images and go on field trips over the internet and show them what I want to show them without having to take them out to the field. Uh, that could be very useful and powerful tool as we develop collaboration, as Estelle said, with people in different countries, different time zones, different deserts, ultimately different planets. Uh, it also provides or, um, or a base for public involvement. I don't want to take three busloads of fifth graders out into the Mojave Desert. It's uh, dangerous, and they would leave considerable footprints and damage to the ecosystem. But I would love to take hundreds of busloads of fifth graders out into a virtual Mojave Desert and have them explore that desert in a way that they really would never have the option to in real life. And I'd like them to even be involved in the science. Help us explore, help us look for things, help us understand and document what we're seeing. So that the data sets that we would build up serve a science function, serve a collaboration function, and they serve an outreach and education function. So I'm very excited about using these technologies and making them tools for understanding these extreme environments on Earth and then using them when we explore the moon and Mars the same way. That's all I wanted to say, uh, Michael, so I'll pass it. Okay. Let me just so, say, this was a gigapan that was taken when Chris went out to the field in, what was that, May? Was that? The last time you went to the Mojave, was that May, Chris? <coughs> yeah, and, this is a gigapan that was taken uh, last spring on one of our expeditions <coughs> with teachers to the Mojave. Uh, it was taken by an undergraduate student. So a couple of comments on what Chris said. Uh, first thing is that there's this um, crust, sort of a desert crust in, in a desert that actually when you walk on it you can break it and you can change the structure of the environment right so people actually walking around to look at the environment take images um, do do damage permanent damage um, might eventually recover but permanent damage um, so one of the things Chris has looked at is how to take these images in a non-destructive way so how can we go out without having people walking around and actually acquire this data the second point I wanted to make about it was when Chris originally raised, you know, this issue about let's do Mojave in high res, um, he said millimeter. I said think in terms of a few centimeters um, because I don't know how to manage millimeter. Um, but the, the truth about it is if you do, assuming it's a fairly flat plane, if you do uh, uh, it at the millimeter resolution in imaging, it's going to be on the order of a terabyte or a few terabytes. Uh, that's a per, per square kilometer. 
Um, that's a fair amount of data, but we have satellites that you know, the Solar Dynamic Observatory, for example, that I'm familiar with, brings down about five terabytes a day. Um, so this is not data volumes that are necessarily unmanageable by humans. But the, do, the point I wanted to make about that is, and, but if we start doing that, okay, so there's more than one kilo, square kilometer in the Mojave, there are quite a few. Um, so that makes the number larger, and if you start adding multispectral, you get maybe we're at a petabyte, so um, at least petapixels. So I, I, um, I was thinking about suggesting to Ilya and, and um, team that next time, it, maybe instead of gigapixel, it's, it's a terapixel or, or petapixel. Anyway, on to Pascal. Pascal Lee. <laughs> Okay, so uh, there's of course much to be said about planetary exploration. Uh, Michael and Estelle and, and Chris mentioned how uh, you want a capability like a gigapixel imager when you are dealing with an environment that's fragile. And of course, you, you also serve when you're dealing with an environment that's difficult to access. Uh, so uh, the first uh, example I wanted to sort of draw on in our past is of course from the Apollo program. The Apollo astronauts did not have a gigapan with them, but they still felt the need and were in fact um, commissioned to acquire high resolution panoramic images of the lunar surface. And there were essentially four functions that were served uh, in that requirement. One was post-mission traverse reconstruction. We, we knew approximately where they were on the moon. They, of course, had a traverse planned out in, in some detail. But at the end of the day, there, was a, there were discrepancies and differences between the actual plan and what was uh, actually covered and walked on or driven over by them. So acquiring panoramic images was a way to uh, acquire post-mission some form of situation awareness of where they had been, what they had seen, and, and what exactly we had explored. Uh, the second reason, of course, is to acquire a broader scientific context for the samples that were collected or for the more localized observations that were made. Uh, the third reason, of course, was to do uh, a bit what uh, Michael was talking about earlier, uh, and Chris as well, uh, in some sense to build up an archive of lunar information to be revisited by other scientists later or by the same science team, but with more time, the head rested and, and post-mission. And so the idea is to have uh, taking advantage of our presence there, our transient presence at this site, to, to acquire a permanent record of what that site had to offer uh, for exploration. So that was the idea of science follow-up. Uh, and then <clears throat> the fourth reason, of course, uh, and in those days it was called just public relations, but today it's education and public outreach. Uh, you want to, to use these panoramas as, as an educational tool and, of course, as something that the, the public can, can enjoy and relate to. Next. So I'm just going to show you two gigapans. Uh, the first one to illustrate uh, some issues and opportunities that we have with, with imaging for science. And we're going to take you to a site in the Arctic, but I just want to run down the, the reasons here uh, and the things that we, we've been using these panoramas for. One, again, is to use panoramic high-resolution imaging to create some form of situational awareness that could actually become a real-time feature in future missions. Okay, on Apollo it was post-mission, but in the future, if we have the bandwidth, and we will, uh, we will be able to acquire Gigapans live, so to speak, and, and actually track what's going on in the landscape, uh, especially if we are uh, monitoring the, the activity of humans in it. Uh, the second reason, uh, geologic context, you'll see here that we can use an image like this, a panoramic image, to really have a sense of scale of the features that we're looking at. Uh, the third reason is to conduct opportunistic science, and that's sort of the science follow-up. The gigapan that you're going to see was not acquired to do science, uh, but it is a gigapan that you can use to do science. Okay? It was acquired for actually logistical reasons, but you can do, you can do science with it. And of course, this is where you see how uh, resolution, for example, will impact your ability to do uh, a lot of science or, or, or not a lot. 
And again, it wasn't tailored for that. And then the fourth, the fourth thing, of course, is the educational value of it. So let's go to the first GigaPan. So what you're going to see next is a GigaPan of Devon Island in the high Arctic. Uh, we've been returning to this site for, for 15 years now, 15 summers consecutively with NASA funding. Uh, and it's a site that we sort of uh, casually call Mars on Earth, but it's really a, an incredible uh, analog. And there are many other good places on the Earth that present you with Mars or, or lunar analogs. This one is, is one of them. But it has uh, a number of really uh, interesting attributes. For one thing, it has a meteorite impact crater. And what you're seeing here is an area that's near the rim of Houghton Crater, looking out to, out, outside of the crater, not towards the crater, but towards the outside of it. And the very broad plane that you see sort of in the middle of the frame and stretching out to the, to the right of it uh, is actually an ancient proglacial lake bed. Uh, if you were to walk that surface, rather than be dealing with a, a very rough ejecta blanket from the impact crater, you actually would be dealing with a very, very smooth, fine-grained, silty surface. And that's because after the impact took place, glaciations came in and out uh, and left silty deposits, uh, especially when there were ice dam lakes uh, in the area. But the point I want to make is going to be made with uh, the few snapshots we're going to zoom into. So why don't we go to the first one on the right there of the snapshots. So the right. Yeah, that one. So this is the logistical reason why we had created this GigaPan in the first place. Uh, and that was to understand the context and therefore have operational situational awareness of where our Humvee rover and the K-10 robotic rover that's mounted on its roof uh, were positioned. Uh, note that this is actually a GigaPan altogether that was acquired without a tripod. It was a handheld one uh, done sort of uh, a la Apollo in the old days. Uh, and the reason was because it was raining and there was actually very little time to, to set it up properly, etc. And you can tell it was raining. The, the K-10 rover that's on the roof of the Humvee is actually covered by, by the tarp. Okay, next slide. Uh, we were also trying to keep track of uh, this explorer who was on his own out there scouting out the terrain. Okay. So this is another way we had some situational awareness of where our crew members were uh, as it was raining. And uh, you might mention there are polar bears there sometimes, so you do have to There, pay there are polar bears too, although that wasn't the purpose of uh, the GigaPan because the processing wasn't fast enough to do anything about the polar bear. But, um, uh, so this is a, a scientist from Johnson Space Center who's essentially scouting out some sites to, to explore up close with, with the robot. Uh, the third image is an opportunistic science uh, observation. We are discovering here, without having looked for it, uh, a, a sulfur-rich deposit on a, on a rocky surface that's sort of uh, broken off. And then the, so this is sort of a geologic uh, observation of, that's opportunistic. And then the last image shows you actually a, a fossil of a stromatoporoid, so it's a coral form from the uh, Ordovician here, so it's roughly 400 million years old. Uh, what you're looking at, these bluffs are actually ancient coral reefs, uh, and sure enough you have this little hemispherical uh, stromatoporoid. We, we don't, s you can't tell that it's a stromatoporoid. We happen to know it because we're familiar with these fossils at that site, and maybe an astronaut who would have gone to this site and have, have seen others would say quite confidently that that's exactly what it is. Okay, next slide. So uh, I'm showing you here so on this one what an actual stromatoporoid at, at sort of sufficient resolution looks like. The next, uh, the next topic I want to discuss in the context of humans is the practical implementation and difficulties of doing that uh, in planetary exploration and even here on the earth when you're in an environment that's uh, extreme or, or let's say just difficult. Uh, last year, we, <clears throat> we drove uh, about 500 kilometers uh, along the Northwest Passage uh, on sea ice in this uh, Humvee. The idea was to ferry the vehicle to Devon Island, and we eventually got it there this year. Uh, but uh, it was quite an adventure. The ice was extremely rough. We uh, had plenty of time, since we were stuck in various places, to acquire uh, GigaPan images. Uh, but uh, the point is, when you're in an environment that's uh, relatively hostile, it's actually difficult to set up uh, a GigaPan system unless it's somehow adapted for, for this type of environment. It's very cold. Uh, the battery would die within uh, 15 to 20 minutes all the time. So we, we were really struggling with this. The temperature was at, were around minus 30 or so. Uh, but once you had set up the GigaPan outside, 
then you realize that you could acquire a data set that you could then enjoy not only process on site uh, and stitched on site, but you could enjoy it for, for the several days that you were stuck at this location by, say, a, a snowstorm or, or, or waiting for a spare part to be, to be uh, brought, brought back by our team. So, uh, and that was an opportunity for us to examine the vehicle uh, without going outside ourselves, but just enjoying the Gigapan that had been acquired during a, a window of good weather to examine the vehicle, its state, uh, every nut, every bolt. And that actually was a, was a useful uh, exercise. So let's go to the Gigapan here. <clears throat> so this is the um, Moon One Humvee rover stuck in a little valley with a broken rear right geared hub, so you can't see it on this side. But just from zooming in, say, to the first yep, image on the right, <clears throat> snapshot on the right. So this one was acquired with a tripod properly. Uh, you can see that you can easily go in and count the nuts and bolts and make sure that none of them are missing. The whole uh, drivetrain was undergoing a lot of stress. And, and uh, you know, you're seeing snow here on Mars. It might be dust or, or sand that's covering all your, um, <clears throat> your, your wheels. Uh, let's go to that particular side. Yep. Yep. Okay, this one just shows you one of the three sleds that we were pulling along with us. So the Humvee was pulling a sled and then the snowmobiles. We had two snowmobiles pulling uh, each another sled. The sleds were named after the different institutes that I, were behind the expedition. So this one was the SETI sled. Uh, uh, you can also tell from the next snapshot on the right. Uh, what we were reading during these long hours of uh, waiting for the weather to improve. Uh, and you can read that from what shows up in the windshield of our vehicle. It's the Gigapan user manual, <laughs> which you want to take along with you because there are plenty of things you'll forget if you don't. Uh, OK, so I'll leave it at this. And this is just an application that I anticipate we will have in the context of uh, human exploration, uh, which is to acquire better situational awareness of, of your vehicles or, or habitats. Thanks. So the next thing we're going to do is open it up to questions. But before I do that, um, are there anybody, anybody on the panel like to say anything additional to add anything? Chris, anything to add? Okay. Actually, yeah. one, one thing I'll just say is that uh, with the Astro Biology Institute, we have four gigapans that uh, we send out into the field, and they are pretty much all spoken for all the time. So the graduate students are usually the ones that sort of word of mouth gets around, and then they contact us and say, can I take one out into the field? So there's a lot of enthusiasm for this. It's just we need, we need uh, probably what we've learned is uh, the better training on adjustment for lights and uh, things like that. How do, you, how do you deal with different lighting conditions? That's, that's one of the biggest challenges that they've had. And uh, the training videos that are online have been very helpful. So Chris, were you starting to say something? Uh, were you, did you have a comment? No. Uh, so are there any questions? We're open. Yes. Um, the one that I, sh when, so I'll say a few words about that. Um, we do, we don't have actually color cameras on Mars. What we have is we have cameras with um, 13 or 14, if you consider the sun filter, um, very narrow band filters. Three of those filters are more or less red, blue, green, but not very close. Right? Not close enough that if you put them together in a straight way, it looks like Mars colors. Um, and so we, we actually, as a typical product, we produce two products, one of which is near, near approximate Mars color, approximate true color. And the one you looked at was approximate true color. We also have suites of images that are stretched in order for you to see geologic formations or um, mineralogical formations of particular kinds, so we have stretched. But um, coloration on 
so it's, I, I just have to say a little bit more. Coloration on Mars is not obvious. Um, it took, frankly, it took months after we landed Pathfinder for people to settle on what the right colors were, and it's taken months. It took months on MER as well. Um, we have a color calibration target, but even given that and knowing sort of what the colors were ahead of time, it takes quite a while. And I'll just give you one component of that. And, and by the way, the, the, the elements of that are that light on Mars isn't like light on Earth. Even if it was lit like Earth, what would be the right thing to do? And um, one component of that is the shadows, right? Um, the shadows in, in an environment tend to be, have a lot of influence from uh, ambient light, from atmospheric light that's coming, and the atmosphere is a different color on Mars than it is on Earth. So in fact, the sh if, you, if you make the sunlit parts um, in a color that's close to what you would think you would get if, with a flash bulb on Mars, um, then the shadowed parts won't be that same color. So it's, it's a pretty complicated game, but the one that you looked at was actually near Mars colors. No. I, it, I mean, you could you. I mean, as we do, you can do your best guess at turning it back into that. Um, the it turns out that the color filters we use on Mars are, are ch the choice of those was to distinguish mineralogies. So we probably could have, you know, decided it was a kind of sulfur based on the filters we chose to decide it was this kind of mineralogy or that kind of mineralogy. But. Um, but in general, it's, it's a little bit of a process. Now, if you, if you actually went there with a, a strobe or a flash and uh, exposed it, then you could get, and you had a three-color camera, which we have a, we'll have on uh, the next rover mission, um, then you could get something pretty close to that. Other questions? Yes? Chris, if you put in survey benchmarks in the Mojave at the locations in the So if you put Survey benchmarks? Yes. Um, so Chris, the question was, uh, are you putting um, survey benchmarks in the Mojave and observing those or looking at those? Is that accurate? Yeah, we are, and, and there are survey benchmarks there. Some of them are put in as part of geodetic surveys, uh, and some of them are our own benchmarks as terms of key sites that we are going to watch and monitor. But the problem is we don't know where in the future we'll want to be focusing and looking back. So we pick the benchmarks and the key <coughs> reference points as best we can, but we're somewhat restricted by not knowing what the future is going to be. We know the Mojave's going to change. We just don't know how it's going to change. And, and actually, so you transition in an environment like Mojave uh, takes place all the time, right? So there will be growths that come and growth that go. And one has to have at least a fairly reasonably sized survey in order to be able to distinguish whether this is just a small transitory effect or a larger one. Exactly, exactly. The prediction is that the Mojave will become significantly drier over the next decade or two. And that should have a profound impact on the things that we study. We don't know in advance what that impact is going to be. We don't know in advance how to best separate the secular change in time with the small natural variability, as Michael was just saying. Things change all the time. Now, superimposed on that is a systematic change due to global warming. We want to have enough data to separate those effects. Other questions? Yes? Has the Mars panorama information been used to extract anything quantitative about distances, of scale, or mapping, topography, like that? So, um, so let me back up just a slight bit. Um, 
when you're, when you're in an environment, when you walk out on Earth, for the most part, you use clues to determine the size of objects around you. So this bush, this tree, this car, gives you a very good indication of size. If you go to some place like the Arctic or Antarctic where you don't have noticeable signs of that, um, you can be easily misled as to the size of objects, and that, that's certainly true on Mars where you don't have any indication. Um, however, so the Mars rovers have stereo cameras that are well calibrated. So we, we understand the dimensions, and we can, we can do calibration. You know, we can easily do a geometric reconstruction of a site 100 meters in diameter, for example, um, of what you can see. And so we, we understand that reconstruction and the size of objects at that scale very well. Um, the, so uh, we use that for creating three-dimensional virtual reality models and then we drive vehicles around it, for example. Um, that scene that I showed you really early on was what we initially called the Great Wall, um, this white outcrop in front of us. And then as we began to look at it, uh, we discovered it was about halfway up to your ankle. Right. And we actually did the model, so sometimes you can be misled. But yeah, we do, and we do that geometric yes. stuff. Yeah, and there's various kinds of software systems we use in order to um, represent that and to measure between points and to um, you know look at slopes and what it would occur if you filled it up with water and things like that. Think it was uh, how are we doing? One more question. So one more question. Or not. All right, well we have the same thing. Uh, there is one. Yes. I mean I can follow up with you asked afterwards, but I've been really interested in the citizen science approach the citizen science approaches to environmental sensing using uh, <coughs> inexpensive equipment. And I wonder and I guess you can't follow up after. Do you have recommendations on inexpensive sensor? And filter combinations that effectively use techniques that are relevant to what we So, the, um, so both Chris and Pascal would probably be the best ones to answer this. But the question was, um, for repeating for Chris, what was the? Um, do you have recommendations on inexpensive sensors that be used in these environments? Um, environmental. Is it, is it for rocks or data? In the sense for, that you said you don't have RGB filters on your cameras. Yes. <coughs> In order to in order to capture image data, yeah. is that the question? Yeah. So I don't. I don't know of anything that's inexpensive. <laughs> <laughs> Chris, did you understand the question? Yeah, I got the question. Uh, we're we're working with five sets of sensors. Six actually, about six. One is just regular image, like GigaPaint. You get visual part of it. The other is um, modifying cameras to be sensitive to the one micron region, the near infrared, to allow, according in those wavelengths, and to allow night operations of the rovers that are doing the imaging. The other is laser, uh, laser scanning, where uh, the distortion of a laser track is used to get the power. Something that's been developed here, among other places, with NASA aims for mapping out contours and defects in shuttle tile. And the science payload, so those instruments are for mapping and navigation. And then for the science payload, we have three instruments that we're focusing on. One is a chlorophyll system called a hand ferrometer, commercial system that measures chlorophyll activity by pulsing the chlorophyll system with light. The second instrument is a simple uh, optics spectrometer, by ocean optics spectrometer, to measure reflectance, functional wavelength, and the visible. And then the third is the uh, most expensive and represents a development item for us, which is a near infrared Brahman spectrometer operating with a laser at one micron and looking at Brahman spectrum from that long wavelength laser. The long wavelength is chosen to get around scattering fluorescence 
minimize gathering of fluorescence. So that's our instrument suite right now. Thanks. I'll just mention one more thing. Um, I think in the same spirit in which you're asking it, uh, there's a nascent project um, called the Planetary Scan that some of us have been involved with, which is looking at can one produce uh, huge swarms of inexpensive instruments which are effectively attached to some kind of grid so that you can um, um, really get in-depth, broad, uh, information about what's going on in the world. And that's still a pretty new effort, but I think um, Planetary Scan it's, is on yeah, the web, right? if you just Google Planetary Scan, NASA Earth Sciences, and Cisco, it'll come up. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Thanks to our friends from NASA. We really appreciate that perspective. It's wonderful to have you all travel here.